Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Widowed and Young. I'm Shalini Bala Lucas, and I'm an ambassador for Way. And this is part of the 25 Tuesdays IGTV conversations that we've been having every Tuesday as we celebrate 25 years of this amazing charity. And I've been talking to people who are challenging widowhood stereotypes, talking about things like widow's fire, sexual bereavement, interracial marriages, cultural challenges, and just the messiness of grief. And today I'm really looking forward to a conversation with Joanna Pereira, who is going to talk about a different kind of grief. Now, what I find really interesting is uh, when I spoke to Joanna is that we all think that when somebody passes away, when our loved one dies, when our spouse dies, when our partner dies, that uh, it's, it, a lot of us are devastated by that. But for some people, it's not that easy. It's a lot more complicated. So I'm going to just get Joanna to join us. So if you just bear with me. And while she's joining, tribe and I just want to remind you that a lot of what we have here can be triggering. So please hold yourself in compassion. And it, it, it can be quite sensitive. So just being aware of that. So there she is. I can see you need to raise the um, raise your phone again. There we go. Keep raising. There we go. Can you yeah. see me okay? I can now. Yeah, perfect. I can see I you. Can you okay? Yes. So if everybody would like to give us a thumbs up to make sure you can see and hear both of us okay. We've had some technical issues over the last couple of weeks. I'm sure it's going to be fine today because I know we have a lot to talk about. So Joanna, welcome. Thank you. And thank you, thank you very much for inviting me to have this open conversation. Thank you. So, Joanna, I was just introducing you and I wanted you, good, we're getting some thumbs up so people can see and hear us. Thank you, everybody. I wanted you to, to first tell us um, a little bit about how you met your husband, how long you were married for, and then how he died. So just, just to give us, paint us a picture. Sure. Um, and can I say, it, it's actually been a long time since I've spoken about my relationship. So um, just thinking about that made me realize how difficult um, it is to uh, acknowledge that part of my grief, <laughs> which is the reason why I'm grieving. Um, but I met Mike actually in, in an online dating site and Match.com uh, at the time. And I met him in 2009. Um, Mike had uh, already been married, so I was his second wife, although he was my only husband. Um, but we'd been together for nine years, um, all together for nine years, uh, but only married for four years before he died. Um, he died of a brain tumor in 2018, and it was quite quick. So from diagnosis to death, it was three months. And um, I um, nursed him at home. And um, it was a decision that um, I was quite happy with because it was the shock of finding out that um, our relationship had been interrupted whilst we were still working on it um, was something um, that I had to deal with and nursing him at home was was part of that. Okay so tell me a little bit about Mike he was older than you and he you had um, you had two children together is that correct? Well interesting um, Mike was older than me he was 15 years older than me and he already had two children from a previous relationship um, they were in, in their teens when I met uh, Mike, um, but I had one child from a previous relationship. Um, so we had three children between us that weren't ours, but um, later on, five years down the relationship, um, in fact, a year after we married, or less than a year after we married, uh, we had a, a daughter together. So we have one child together. Okay, so how old was your daughter when Mike died? Yeah, she was three and a half when he died. So that was really difficult because I had to not only deal with my own grief, but I had to deal with hers. And it was um, 
actually um, in the, her trauma was increased because one, she had been exposed to um, the difficulties in our relationship, but also the second was because she was actually diagnosed with, um, she was diagnosed with autism not long after his death. So she, she was already coping with that um, before his death. That exacerbated it once he died. Okay, and this is four years ago that he died? Absolutely, yes, four years so ago. She's seven and a half now, okay. Jenna, I'm just going to ask you to raise your uh, phone a little bit if you can, just so we can yes. see you a little bit better. That's it, that's better, that's good. Is that better? Um, that's much better, thank you. So you've alluded to working on your relationship, so it kind of um, implies that there were issues in your relationship. Can you share as little or as much as you feel that you want to about what was happening in your relationship before Mike died? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's not an easy subject, but I believe that the more we share, the better and the stronger we become at facing and confronting our difficulty. Um, I don't think it was just um, an age-related um, difficulty because there are many age gap relationships that work incredibly well. Um, for me, um, was that Mike had his own difficulties, perhaps from his previous relationship, which he was throwing in within our newer relate relationship. So Mike was incredibly controlling. Um, there was coercive control in our relationship. There was emotional and psychological abuse. And I trusted him. I, I respected him. I come from a culture where we, um, anybody older than us is seen as ma more mature, wiser. And I had a lot of respect for him. So I went along with a lot of, of what he, um, he put on the table. Um, the, the problem was that I became more and more isolated from family and friends due to the control. Um, for example, he would sulk if I chose to just go out and spend time with my eldest daughter. Um, so he would sulk that he had to stay with our younger daughter. And it became so challenging just doing the most basic things away from him that eventually I stopped going out away from home without him at all. So it became just me do, making sure that I um, reassured him and it was about him. I walked on eggshells all the time um, and I couldn't even work because um, he, even though we had horrific financial circumstances, he wouldn't let me work. It was all part of that control, all part of making sure that he knew where I was at all times. Um, even text messages to my child, my eldest child, were controlled. He was always checking them and making sure what she was saying. Um, it it became up to it just came to a point where I was completely isolated, completely dependent on him for everything, um, literally everything. Yeah. It sounds like you were in a very oppressive relationship and it, it, it sounds like if you could, you would have got away. So how did you react when you realized that Mike was terminally ill and he was going to die? What was that? What was the overwhelming feeling? Oh, my gosh. Um, when I first found out that he, was, uh, that he was terminally ill, I was devastated because... Um, I didn't want him to die. I wanted us to have a chance to um, work at our relationship. I wanted us to fix things. I wanted, this couldn't be it for me. This couldn't be it. This, this was um, not how it was meant to end, not in limbo. And um, I, um, I, I, when I was nursing him at home, I, I, I was trying to make sure that I actually healed him because I wanted him to get better so that we could um, make things better within our relationship. And, and, and I had, I was so disconnected that I remember thinking, 
if he gets better, then our relationship will get better. We will get closer. Things will get better because we've had this massive scare now and now we realize that we could lose each other. We could lose, one of us could die and everything's going to be okay. But that's not how really it ended because when he did die, there was the realization that yes, he died without us resolving our grievances. How does that make you feel now, knowing that you, you didn't have the chance to resolve it, but also with hindsight, do you think you would have been able to resolve it, knowing what you knew about Mike and knowing what you knew about your relationship, looking back? Of course, the shock of it made me believe that we could have. Um, it was all part of the, the imbalance of the relationship. I was always the one working on it. I was always the one um, hoping for, for better days, hoping for... Um, better outcomes I was always hoping that he would change so that moment when we found out the diagnosis was just an exacerbation of, of what was unhealthy about our relationship um, I've spoken to people or widowed people who were in healthy relationships and although the shock of the you know of a diagnosis was devastating there was also a certain acceptance that, okay, this is the person I love. They're going to die, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hug them, love them, kiss them until that last moment. And, and there's, a, there's a, a loving acceptance. To me, there was just this despair because things weren't right. Um, so this desperation was, was, was not healthy. It was just um, a side effect of a symptom of the relationship that we were in. And what when happened? I realized, Go on. It wouldn't have changed. And actually, I feel a lot of shame and a lot of guilt that I didn't leave the relationship sooner, um, even if I hadn't known he was going to die. Because I think about the impact the abuse had on my children. I think about the damage that actually was left behind after his death which could have been avoided had I left a relationship earlier. Um, could I have left? I don't know. But is the shame there? Deeply. And the guilt. And, and that's, it's, you, it's incredibly embarrassing sometimes just talking about it. That I, I've allowed myself to be in an abusive relationship and um, didn't leave. So I'm going to ask you a really tough question, Joanna. You didn't leave. You feel shame and guilt. Do you feel a relief that he died and actually took that out of your hands and that actually you are free of him now? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that is um, the taboo um, part of this um, different kind of grief is that eventually you wake up that day there's this particular day that you wake up and you've mourned the loss of the loved one you still love them you still care for them and you still want them in your life but you feel relief and it's scary to say this but you feel as if your life is better off and it was difficult for me to feel these feelings. I felt incredibly isolated um, because I remember when I joined Way, there were just beautiful pictures of people sharing all these amazing memories they had with people that they loved. And it felt so, I felt so separate from that beautiful ring because that hadn't been my experience of a loving relationship. I hadn't had a loving relationship. And also I had to acknowledge that, that I hadn't and that, that I had put on this facade, not just for myself, but for my family and, and for his family. There was this facade that our relationship was working. Um, I think a lot of um, widowed people in, in um, dealing with a different kind of grief will relate to the facade that we put up. Nobody wants to acknowledge that their relationship isn't perfect or that their relationship isn't quite what it's meant to be. Um, so 
it, there, there was an acknowledgement that um, okay, my relationship wasn't like this, and and I now feel incredibly isolated. I can relate to the death experience, to the separation, the physical separation, the, the losing someone that I love. So I still love my husband. Um, so I could relate to that grief part, but I couldn't relate to this love experience, to this wanting them back experience. Um, so yeah, and, and the more isolated I felt, the more wrong I felt my feelings were. So the more wrong I felt that feeling relief was. And so that's why I, I needed to do some research. I needed to understand what was going on because surely I'm not the only person on earth that has lost somebody with whom they had a difficult relationship. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know that for you to, to share that is really brave. It's honest. And I think uh, there will be women out there and men who will resonate with that, this, but we don't talk about it enough because it's, as you say, taboo. And also there's that whole thing about not speaking ill of the dead. And yet we need to be honest about the relationships we've had. So thank you so much. You talked about joining Way. How did Way help you? And, and in what ways did it help you? Yes. Oh, gosh. Way was um, in indispensable I, I couldn't have gone through the widow journey uh, without way and that's because I think a, being a, a widow at any age is I'm, I'm assuming for someone older is challenging but I think being widowed young and with children or with you know in the, mid, you're in the middle of, of building your life with a partner can be even more challenging. And um, without way, I wouldn't have been able to just carry on in, in, the, 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 in the sense of, of understanding what was happening um, with, with my life and at that particular time. Um, for example, Nobody around me, nobody in my community had been widowed young. So it, it was, I was completely, statistically, I was, I was not just a minority. I was a minority of two, maybe. <laughs> I yeah. didn't know. Um, I think I met another person in the community, but they had actually moved in to the area uh, after being widowed young. So I, I was an incredibly small number statistically. And to feel that pain alone would have just been, I think it would have been impossible. Way came in and brought this ray of light where I knew I could share my current, that current experience of losing someone with others who understood that loss. So it was invaluable. So much so that you then have become a volunteer um, you've, nom you've been nominated this year for Way's Annual Award for members who've made an exceptional contribution to the charity. Congratulations. I mean, you Thank didn't you. just become a Way member. You've embraced it. You volunteer. You're an area of contact for Way. What, why, why do you do this? Why do you do this for Way? Go that extra mile, which yeah. you do. Because Way changed my life. I think um, once um, I had, you know, gone through this big, huge change in my life, I became a different human. And Way was there to support me through this transition. I'm going to call it a transition because it wasn't, it wasn't one that I chose, but it was one that happened. And Way was there to, to help me through that. That help, um, I'm so grateful for that I felt the need to support others too. Once I felt strong enough, I thought, do you know, actually, when I first joined Way, those beautiful people that welcomed me and that, you know, made me feel understood, they, they changed my, you know, my experience. They, they, they made me feel so, you know, so loved. 
that I want to give that to someone else. I want others to feel that same way. And so I volunteered. I think Way is a fantastic charity. And as far as I can, I will always volunteer for the Way. <laughs> Thank you. Back. Well, well um, you, being nominated for, for the annual award is a huge deal. So congratulations. You've gone that extra mile and you've set up a face group uh, a Facebook group for Way members called A Different Kind of Grief. And I know there are a few members here who've already commented and, and we'll read their comments shortly. Tell us why you set this up and what are the kinds of different kind of grief that you're coming across in this group? Yes, yes. Um, it's interesting that initially when I first set up the group, I, I set it up because as I told you in the beginning, it was difficult to, when I went to research online, it was difficult to find information regarding the, the, the sort of the ambiguities and complicated parts of relationships relating to death, um, death and dying. And so the information was so small that I thought actually the best thing to do is maybe to find out if there are other people out there that may feel the same way I do bring them together and maybe we can support each other. If there isn't enough support out there, then we can support each other. So I started the group with this understanding that there, will, there would be a few people, maybe 30, 40 or 50 was, was my, my maximum number. Um, and so I, I started the group so that we could have conversations around, honest conversations around our relationships um, before we were widowed and how they had impacted our current status as widows, our current grief, our bereavement, how we mourned, how we saw ourselves. And when the group was created, um, a few people joined and within a few days, lots more had joined. And the group is now has, is, has nearly 300 members. And I am, humbled because it was actually the group that the people in the group that made me feel that gave me the courage to to say oh actually this is this happens there's nothing unnatural about this this kind of grief it does happen it's just that it's not only a taboo there's a lot of shame around it it's not socially accepted to talk about or speak ill of the dead so what we are doing is we are redefining um, this idea of compromising the truth for the sake of death. So we, we're saying, no, we're not going to do that. In yeah. order for us to heal, to fully heal, heal, we have to acknowledge what has happened to us. Um, that doesn't mean never forgiving, never forgetting. It just means we have to heal. And then once, we, once we've healed and we've accepted and reached that place of acceptance, we can fully move on or move forward. So we started having conversations around the complexities that we had during our relationships. And those included, and I'm talking, I'm going to talk about the sort of milder work because the, the, the harder ones can be very triggering. But those included, for example, um, drug, drugs, a drug addiction, relationships where there were children involved and there are drug addictions or alcoholism. And um, there, are, there are these, these, you know, drug addiction and alcoholism can bring these problematic behaviours um, that destroy relationships. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's included gambling addiction mm -hmm. and also um, the spending on, on sex workers whilst, um, you know, um, perhaps you're struggling with money in the first place as a family and, and your partner, your spouse is, is spending all this money on, on something that, um, in, in, in a monogamous society where we are meant to be as a couple, you know, what two of two, um, and, and there's this agreement of monog monogamy, um, perhaps spending money on, on sex workers is not um, 
an accepted behavior socially and therefore it becomes problematic it's problematic and so um so yeah those are some of the issues that we have to talk about um in order to Hi, I'm back, I think. Hi. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yes, you're definitely back. I can yes, see you I now. Can. Can you... Okay. I'm so sorry about that. It's obviously connection issues as usual. I am in Kenya for those watching, but um, hopefully we'll keep going. I've just got a, a backup, so... Okay, so you were telling us... Sorry about that, everyone. Do join us. Join no, us again. That's okay. so you were telling us about... So, um, what, what was really important for the group was that we we had the opportunity to articulate our grievances because there was an understanding that without those without those articulations um, we were finding ourselves stuck in in the grieving process so we weren't grieving properly we weren't healing we weren't moving forward we were just stuck. Okay, so and it's really interesting. It's really interesting to hear all the stories, um, not the stories, but the types of things that people were going through in relationships, because I think I mentioned to you offline that we always just think when somebody dies, that you are, you feel grief, that the loss of that person. But for you, there was a lot of anger, there was some relief, there was uh, and I know you talk about anger quite a lot. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Yes, of course, of course. And I always try to use um, a sort of um, a, a, a short um, example as, a, you know, a, a, just a little example of 
if if somebody just sort of punched you on the face and left left you with a big blue purple eye, it's fine if they they run off and and do whatever. The, the thing is, you might forgive them, you might even forget, but you still have to deal with with this. Mm purple thing that you have on your face you still have to deal with this pain and you have to go in a mirror and look at this every day and what do you do you're not looking like the same you you, you know you're not the same person that you were two days ago when you didn't have a black eye and so the anger comes from that the anger comes from knowing that but for what that person's done you would not have this black eye. You would not be feeling this pain. You would not have to go to the doctor maybe to get painkillers or maybe to become infected and and now you've got pus coming out, (laughs) you know? So that's where the anger comes from. The anger is that that pain wasn't entirely caused by you. It wasn't your fault. And it was because you were violated. It was because you were disrespected. Um... And so there's a lot of anger because you're confused, especially when you think you're in a loving relationship. There's a lot of confusion because you think, if somebody really loves me, can they hurt me this much? Can they give me this black eye? And you're confused because you love them. And and this confusion translates in anger because you're thinking, wait a minute, then, then what is it? Is it love? Is it is it something else? And so you start to get angry and And anger is the biggest part of of that around grief, that kind of grief and bereavement is because you you are so confused, you are so lost, you are so, um, there's so much shame around the difficulties you've had in that relationship that it translates into anger. And it becomes a big part of, of um, and also because you start to hate the behaviors that um, your partner showed towards you and and you become angry. And it's justified anger. At, at first, I, I felt upset with myself for feeling angry, but I realized, no, that anger is justified because there was an injustice committed and it's justified. And it's okay to feel angry. And it's only uh, when you acknowledge that that you you start to 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 be okay with it and you start to release and let go of it. And I know that way helped you, but did you take did you get any bereavement counseling to to start healing through that anger and, and that shame yeah. and hurt, as you say? Absolutely, because at the anger stage, I was so stuck with nowhere to go there was nowhere to turn and and there were times where I spoke to my family um about it and they couldn't cope with it they couldn't listen they 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 there was a lot of discomfort um I I have a mixed family so um, my African family has this very um this this very ritualistic uh, belief in the afterlife that talking any type of ill of the dead means that they might come back and and haunt you. So there was a lot of no, no, we're not listening to this. Um, and and I I was just so isolated and so shut down. You know, I was so dismissed. My anger, my feelings were so dismissed that I had no choice. It was actually physically starting to affect me. Um, so this idea that grief affects you physically is very true in, in a natural, in a normal uh, grief situation, but in my situation was really um, affecting me. So I ended up having bereavement counseling and they were only six sessions, but they were incredibly helpful in the sense that I was at least able to speak with somebody. I could see that um, even the bereavement counselor <laughs> from Cruz, um, she was... Um, uh, well, they, I should say, were um, a little bit um, awkward around this idea of, wait a minute, are you saying you're angry with your husband? You're saying you, you're really annoyed at his behavior, that you hate what he's done? And um, But just being able to talk about it allowed me to disentangle and, and organize 
all these thoughts and try to understand why am I feeling so angry with him? I really need to understand. And I myself came to that conclusion. I came to the conclusion that I felt, I felt mistreated. And also I had to hold this mirror in front of me and accept that I had been in, in this, um, you know, this abusive relationship, which is incredibly difficult to say. Um, I, I see myself as a strong woman and it's really, really hard to accept that you would make such a choice. Um, but yes, and, and once I accepted that I was angry and I needed help with it, bereavement counseling helped me to move forward in that sense, to that particular, to become unstuck from that particular um, place where I was stuck in anger. Um, that was really helpful. Um, and also what, what happened was that once I'd come out of the anger stage, I, had, I could recognize that that was because I loved my husband. I loved him so much that how dare he treat me so badly when I loved him so much. But what I, what I was able to do was to take responsibility for how I felt about him. So yes, I loved him. But his side of the, the relationship was his responsibility. Whether he loved me or didn't, that was his responsibility. That was his problem. And I had to let go of that side. Again, that was showing me how unbalanced the relationship was, that I was even carrying his side of the relationship with me. Yeah. And so by letting go of that side, I could acknowledge that that's okay. I did what I had to do. I did what I could do. I loved him. I was there for him. I fought for our relationship. It's okay now to let go. I'm no longer in that relationship. Those are such incredibly powerful words and sentiments because there are going to be so many people watching this who may not have been able to verbalize what you've said because, as you say, there's so much taboo and stigma around saying these things authentically. So thank you so much for sharing. I Honestly, I'm getting goosebumps from hearing you talk because to talk so openly about something like this is brave. And, and thank you so much. Joanna, I want to just a couple more things before we sort of wrap up. You are also a member of a group called Waytheists, uh, a member for, um, for, for members who are atheists. Why did you, why did you join this? And, and tell me a little bit about it. Yes, I love that group. It's always very lively in conversations and discussions. But I joined mainly to regain a part of my identity that I had lost whilst I was in, in my relationship. Um, I had been an atheist from a very young age. I, I grew up in a in in family divided by religion. My African family were, were the Christians. My, my, my um, European family were, were Catholics. And there was, there was always this division, you know. Um, and so I decided by the age of 14, 14 that I was an atheist and I didn't want to have to, to choose between religions and families and the people I loved. When I met my husband, though, he had come from a, a, a very religious of Jehovah's Witness background. And although he had left the religion, he was still very much. He left the religion, but the religion didn't leave him. So he, his life, his choices were very much based by, by what, uh, how he'd been raised. And so we, li we lived this very fake life where in front of his family, who were still, who were still Jehovah's Witnesses, we, we behaved in a certain way. And then behind, me, you know, so it, it was just all so draining and so exhausting because I value being genuine and I'm not perfect, but I value authenticity and, and it was very difficult. So when the opportunity came for this group, I put my hand up and I was so grateful to the, to the young widow that, because um, she's even younger, she, she's in a wavy a group, um, she's a um, fantastic um, uh, widow and she, she, when she started this group, I put my hand up and I said, I want to admin this group with you. And she was great about it. And, and so we both admin the group and, and I love it because we have discussions also around widowhood and religion, not so much religion, but this idea that we, we forget how a lot of our rituals around death dying and mourning are very religious so people yeah. will say i'm praying for you but they forget that maybe prayer means nothing to you mm -hmm. and people say you know they're in a better place or they're in heaven and they forget that you don't believe in heaven 
you know, those things don't give you any comfort. But perhaps you'd rather have a hug. So yeah, I, I really, it was really part of regaining my identity. That's amazing. They, they both sound exceptionally very interesting and very helpful um, groups to, to members who may be feeling that they're not being able to resonate with other widows, right? In, in the ma sort of mainstream mm -hmm. way. So I think they're great subgroups. Just to say to everybody that they're only open to WAY members. And if you are interested in joining, then do email inquiries at widowedandyoung.org.uk for the information or send us a DM on here on Instagram and we will get back to you. I want to ask you a couple more questions, Joanna. How are you and your daughter doing now four years on? And, and are you finding happiness again? Well, yes. Um, for the first time in, in four years, we are, um, we are seeing the lights of, of hope and the, the, the rays of, of happiness. And we've had happy moments. Um, they aren't... Um, lots of them, but they are enough to give us hope for the future. Um, we are still picking up the pieces, but there's a lot of peace in our life now. Um, we still, I mean, my husband, my late husband left us in utter poverty. Um, I've been in, in um, so this is one of, just one of those things I want to quickly say that not all widows are rich <laughs> or widows, widowers in that case. Um, and so we're still picking up the, the pieces. And because I haven't worked in so many years, it means having to um, rebuild this um, labor market package that I need to offer um, to um, prospective employers. And, um, but the peace that we have, there are no rows in the house. There, there's just, um, lots of love is shared and um, so now we can start to see um, that there will be moments that we are going to be happier so, yeah. that's I mean that's a lot there's a lot to be said for that do you have any advice for other young widowed people who are struggling with co the complicated grief that you've described today and and what would you say to people who are going through that I I would definitely say that Whatever you're feeling um, right now, um, your feelings are valid. Feel them. Um, whatever they are. So if you're feeling relief, then acknowledge that feeling um, and validate that feeling. You're feeling it for a reason. You're not feeling it because you're a bad human or because you're... You know, it's because there's a reason and a valid one. So feel them and acknowledge them and and, and accept that your, your grief in whatever its multifaceted way is, is part of the love you felt for the person you lost. And um, so, yeah, accept what you're feeling. No shame, no judgment. Don't judge yourself. Don't feel that you have to hide. And if you can, share with somebody who will understand you. And if you can't, seek help, seek support from a counsellor. Um, but don't hide because that will show up in, in, in your relationships. It will show up in your self-esteem, in, in your daily life. And it will, it will destroy your, your mental well-being. And you really don't need that. You, you need to heal. You need to be strong and, and get out there. So, um, yeah, look after yourself. Thank respect. you so much. Such, such great words of wisdom. Thank you so much. We have so many comments. Let's read some of them. Ella says, a big hello to Joanna from Ella. Um, way a different kind of grief. Murray says, hey, I'm new here. Welcome, Murray. Uh, loads of people, loads of people joined. Vicky um, oh. says, you're so brave to share your story. Joanna, you're brilliant, says Ella. Uh, Mama Rumba says, beautiful honesty. And that's so true. That came through so, so clearly all the way through. Tracy says, it's hard, but you have nothing to be ashamed of. You are amazing. Uh, Emma says, I felt like a fake widow when I first joined Way." 
uh, thank goodness for ADKOG. So I think a lot of people to, um, who, who are part of that group really finding a lot of value from it. Ravi says, incredibly honest and it will help others. I know other widows who've had relationships like this. So that's really interesting. Uh, Mama Ramba mm -hmm. says, you're not alone. Amy says, thank you for being so honest. Uh, and Amy, again, I felt like I lost my voice in my relationship marriage and I got it back when my wife died. I was finally able to tell my truth. Wow. Thank you, Amy, for sharing. Ella really says, powerful. Joanna. Yeah, very powerful indeed. Thank you. Joanna is brilliant and deserves to win. So this is for the uh, nomination. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, Ella says, you've made such a difference to my bereavement. The FB group is my safe space to be honest about my relationship and my relief. How does that make you mm -hmm. feel when you see and hear people say that? Actually, it, um, <laughs> it makes me feel um, um, very understood and, and accepted because I was so alone before I found these awesome people. And uh, yeah, it, it makes me feel very accepted and very understood. Um, I, I, I honestly, yeah, I love everybody in that group. And, and I know them all uh, individually, even the ones that don't always contribute in, in the sense of they, don't, they, all, they aren't ready to open up. I, I see them on the background and I, I see them reading the posts and, and commenting sometimes and I can see that they're healing and they're helping each other heal and, and it's just fantastic, yes. That's amazing, thank you. Amy says, anger has been and still is the emotion I felt most viscerally. This is as you were talking about anger. Um, anger is so appropriate. Rami says, incredibly brave and self-aware, may I add. Absolutely, I agree with that. Um, lots of thank yous, yes. Thank you so, and that you've, yeah, and I think this is a, a true for the whole thing, so well articulated. I think you've really explained you. it so, so beautifully. So thank you, Joanna. Joanna, thank you so much for being so honest, so yeah. open. I'm sorry about the technical hitch, but I'm really glad to say we came back. <laughs> Do you feel like we've said everything you wanted to say to, to everybody listening today? Yes, um, it, I, I just wanted to say that this is definitely a conversation that we need to continue to have around this taboo. And so please, please um, be as open as you can, obviously within reason, um, so as to protect your own well-being. But, and, and I'm so grateful that Wei has given us this open space for this open conversation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna, and thank you for telling us your story. You're getting loads of thank yous as well. Uh, next week, for the last in this series on widowhood taboos, I'll be talking to writer Stacey Heal, widow of Greg Gilbert, lead singer in the indie band The Delays. We'll also bring, be bringing Tracy Ahmed back uh, because we had a technical hitch last week. So watch this space. We'll let you know when she'll be back because she was in the middle of telling us her story. Uh, so do tune in next Tuesday at 8 o'clock. An 18 conversation, I'm sure. Huge thanks to Joanna and to all the brilliant, brilliant guests in this series. Don't forget that we put everything on the archive as well as on our YouTube page. So if you are struggling to find these things, please just DM us. We'll send you a message. Thank you again, Joanna. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'll be back next week. I'm Charlene Ibala-Lucas. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Just June, J-U-S-T-J-H-O-O-M. But until next week, do care take care of yourselves. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.